And it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you so very kindly, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my first question is to the Premier, but I think it's important to acknowledge that this past weekend, almost 2,000 auto workers in Windsor probably had a pretty uh, sleepless time wondering about their futures, and I hope that all members commit to fighting for those good auto jobs in Windsor. Uh, but my question is about other workers, Speaker, to the Premier. People are pretty frustrated with the big cuts and bad choices that this government has been making. On October 13th, nurses in Bimbrook literally were told by the Premier that they had to hand back negotiated wage increases. These nurses work with highly disabled folks, with very, very severely, severely disabled folks 24-7. So my question is, why does the Premier think it's okay to, uh, uh, to take away negotiated wages that these frontline nurses uh, had negotiated with their employer? The Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Our government, of course, values the important contribution of nurses who really are providing our patients with timely, safe, and equitable access to really high quality and appropriate care in a variety of settings. And that's why we have acted swiftly with the pandemic pay to make sure that they are recognized for their efforts. At the same time, the government is committed to protecting our public sector jobs, and that is why we've had our uh, legislation, the Protecting a Sustainable Public Sector Work Act. Um, our government's top priority, of course, is their health and safety, and, and we want to make sure that we continue to support our nurses and make sure that this premium, which is one of the largest ever in the province of Ontario, is out there benefiting 375,000 employees uh, from 2,000 employers. I also want to point out to the member opposite that our hospital sector and most of the other sectors, I believe, have all paid out those uh, extra Response. funds to, to nurses, and we agree that they're playing a vital role in the delivery of health care and will be instrumental as we transform our health care system and emerge from this pandemic. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thanks so much. Uh, Speaker, the fact of the matter is the nonprofit employer here uh, named Able Living or called Able Living wants to do the right thing by these nurses, wants to pay them appropriate wages, but the Premier instead would rather claw them back. He always says no to frontline workers, to our frontline nurses our health care heroes. President of ONA, uh, Vicki McKenna, says this, and I quote something the, minister, uh, the, the member was just speaking to. Uh, the reality is, and I quote, it's time for Premier Ford to honour these nurses, recognise their worth, and do the right thing. I agree with Ms. McKenna. Why does the Premier say no to our nurses, to our PSWs, to the frontline workers that helped us get through this pandemic when he should be saying yes? Again, the Parliamentary System to the Minister of Health. Thank you, and thank you to the member opposite. Our Premier only says yes. He has invested so much money, over $52 million to recruit, retain and support over 3,700 more frontline health care workers and caregivers through our COVID-19 fall preparedness plan, and we have a 27,000 uh, employees, uh, PSWs, nurses, RPNs, which we are recruiting as well. This is the largest recruiting campaign of nurses and PSWs and training initiatives as well in the province's history. We've also acted swiftly to ensure that our health care workers are recognized, as I said, through the pandemic pay, and our government has been working closely with the Mental Health and Addiction Centre of Excellence at Ontario Health and a number of other hospitals to also provide specific supports during these difficult times for frontline workers in order to support them. It's critical Response. to remind the member opposite that as of March this year, more than 6,100 health care workers have been able to access supports that they needed, and we continue to support them in every way we can which during this what we know is a difficult time for all of them. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I would submit that this Premier has no idea how unaffordable life is becoming. Inflation is up. The cost of everyday living is up. A 1% wage increase just doesn't cut it, Speaker. Better wages will actually help our province. All you have to do is ask economist David Card, who very clearly uh, identified that good wages actually help our economy. 
Why can't the Premier say yes? Why can he say yes to his buddies, but not say yes to PSWs, to frontline health care workers, to nurses, to those other frontline workers that were heroes during the pandemic and helped us get through? Why will he not say yes to them? Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, and I think in my last answer, uh, in response to the, the member opposite, I did go through a lot of ways in which this government and our Premier has been saying yes to nurses, PSWs, and our RPNs, who are all working very hard to support us through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we, we've obviously made a decision to proceed uh, with this, uh, with the Protecting a Sustainable Jobs Act. We think it's important to protect those jobs, and we have a policy in place. But we've also recognized the incredible efforts that frontline healthcare workers, especially our nurses and RPNs and PSWs, have gone to through the pandemic pay. And we are on an initiative, which is the highest recruiting and training initiative in the province's history, recruiting and training more nurses, RPNs, and PSWs across the board in this province, so that we can make sure that we have all the health human resources we need need and a great plan going forward. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. After about uh, 19 months of struggling, small businesses like restaurants still do not have a, a level playing field here in our province. Big venues on the one hand, big event spaces like, like arenas uh, and stadiums are full of fans, and that's a great thing. But on the other hand, we have restaurants that are still not getting a fair shake from this government. So my question is, why does the Premier always say yes to his big buddies, to the big fish, but no to the little guy like small local businesses? To reply. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity to answer that. Uh, look, the member, I'm sure, will, uh, can, can well appreciate that the, uh, the return to uh, play protocols of the NHL and uh, uh, NBA and OHL uh, uh, far exceed the, the, minimum, uh, the minimum standards that we are putting in place for our small uh, or non-essential businesses, uh, uh, Speaker. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, as the uh, Chief Medical Officer uh, uh, highlighted, caution is, uh, is what has helped us get to where we're at today. Uh, we are very optimistic, but remain obviously cautious. Uh, we are looking for that data, which will come out uh, uh, in the two weeks following uh, Thanksgiving, Mr. Speaker. And as the Premier indicated uh, uh, last week, we are uh, reviewing uh, new opportunities to exit uh, stage, uh, stage three, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, uh, cautiously optimistic, uh, 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 thanks to the hard work of, uh, of volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, it was a slap in the face last week when restaurateurs uh, had a, a, a no-show of cabinet ministers at a pre-arranged meeting. In fact, uh, the representative from Restaurants Canada said this, and I quote, the industry leaders on the call were angry and extremely frustrated because the government simply not talking to them. And then to add insult to injury, of course, Speaker, on Friday we had a show and tell by the Premier and not a word. Uh, was uh, was provided to give these restaurateurs some hope. So my question is, when will the Premier treat businesses like restaurants, small businesses, better? Treat them as he treats his big buddies. To reply, Governor Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and again, uh, uh, she, the, the member opposite, might call. Uh, it is show and tell, but the vaccination, the, the application that was brought forward by the, uh, the Minister of uh, Digital Government uh, uh, has, and so far, is, is showing to be a great success. Uh, it has been, uh, uh, I'm told that some five, six million Ontarians have, uh, have uh, begun downloading the QR code. I know our small, uh, medium uh, uh, businesses, uh, restaurants, our, the gyms are looking forward to this. It will make it easier. It will, make, uh, it will give us the ability to keep these places open. Uh, which is what they want. They want stability, Mr. Speaker. They want to know that the people and people who are attending restaurants or gyms want to know that it is safe to do so. The app and the QR code will uh, continue uh, to allow us to do that. But we understand. We understand how frustrated uh, uh, small businesses have been. Is why we've been pushing Ontarians to be vaccinated. I'm happy that Ontarians are vaccinated at the numbers that they're at. Spons? Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, the QR code, the vaccine, the application that we brought for Ontarians overwhelming uh, uh, ability to get out there and get vaccinated will help us keep these small businesses open and stay open. The final supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, small businesses have been doing their part, as we all know. They've been checking uh, their certificates, uh, they've been implementing other protocols, and what they need is their government to be there for them. Small mom and pops, like restaurant speaker, have been struggling, struggling to stay afloat. But the Premier is always saying yes. He says yes to his lobbyists, he says yes to his insiders and his buddies, but he's missing in action when it comes to small businesses. So my question is, when will small businesses be invited onto the same playing field as the Premier's big buddies? Again, to reply, the government house leader. Speaker, obviously, uh, small, medium and large job creators are and remain the backbone of the, econo of the economy of the province of Ontario. It is why we've made so many investments to ensure that jobs stay in Ontario and that we bring back the jobs that the pandemic uh, 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 sent away, Mr. Speaker, but it's not just about the pandemic. We are looking at making and continue to make investments, the type of investments that saw the Ontario economy lead the nation prior to the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. We want to, as we emerge from the pandemic, ensure that we have an economy that can, is stable, that is growing, that our small and medium uh, job creators can stay open, Mr. Speaker. That is why we're very encouraged. Uh, by the, the numbers that we continue to see, but it doesn't mean that we're going to claim victory. That's why we've increased uh, ICU capacity, something that the previous Liberal government failed to do. That's why we've increased and are making massive investments in our long-term care sector, Mr. Speaker. But it's also why we're making investments in infrastructure, Response. Mr. Speaker, so that the economy will continue to grow post-pandemic the way it did before the pandemic, and we can continue to lead the nation and be the engine of the economy of this country. Thank you. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education, Early Learning and Child Care. Speaker, Amanda, a mom in my riding, reached out to me recently. At eight months pregnant, she's already worried about the terrifying costs of child care. Like most Ontario parents, Amanda cannot afford to pay the equivalent of a mortgage in child care costs. Most other provinces have a deal with the federal government, including those with conservative governments, but Ontario has yet to sign on. Where is Ontario's deal? What does the minister have to say to parents like Amanda who need $10 a day childcare? To reply to the government, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My message to Amanda is that this government is fighting for a better deal for her family and for all families in this province who want affordable childcare, who want accessible childcare, but want it to be sustainable. So we don't have a scenario where we have a funding program that reduces the cost per child, and then in three, four, five years, that funding, that, that price, it rather increases sharply for them. That's not what we want. We want a sustainable deal that reduces costs for families. After, under the former Liberal government, child care rose by 40 per cent, unacceptable, and a record that is indefensible. Our government has increased investment in child care by making it more affordable through a tax credit, the Ontario um, uh, Care Tax Credit, which is providing roughly $1,500 of savings per child. It was enriched during the pandemic, but obviously we have to continue, and we are in good faith with the federal government, to get a good deal that includes uh, recognition of the unique Response. advantages Ontario provi provides investment, particularly when it comes to all-day kindergarten, so we continue to fight for a better deal for the people of this province. Supplementary question. Speaker, the childcare sector in Ontario is in a state of crisis. Families in Ontario are paying up to $2,000 a month in childcare fees. They cannot afford the Ford government's endless delays. Workers are underpaid and leaving the sector, le leading to severe understaffing. We need to get to work on building a universal, affordable, quality childcare system right away. Will the minister stop dragging his feet and start prioritizing families and childcare workers and deliver a child? Deliver a $10 a day childcare now. Minister of Education. To ensure that the people of this province, the taxpayers, get the best possible deal uh, that they deserve. And I will not uh, you know, take the advice of the opposition parties who would have accepted any deal instead Order. of a better deal with long-term, sustainable, increased investment that Ontario families deserve. The only province worse than Ontario when it comes to child care under the former Liberal government is the NDP province of BC. We agree that both the former Liberals and the Democrats of British Columbia are not examples or, be or benchmarks to look to for inspiration. We have a plan in place to reduce costs, to increase spaces, a billion dollars of investment by our Premier to create 30,000 new spaces, 10,000 of which will be in new schools. I recognize the price of childcare is too expensive to too many families. We knew this, which is why in our first budget we introduced a tax credit to make life a bit more affordable. 
we're going to work with the federal government Spons? in good faith to land a deal that allows sustainable long-term funding that ensures child care is affordable and accessible to families right across Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. I've had the opportunity to visit and meet with many types of businesses in Whitby, and I've been hearing a similar message from many of them. Red tape and burdensome over-regulation regulation has been a barrier to businesses as they look to expand their presence and grow their business. As we continue to combat the fourth wave of the pandemic and businesses plan ahead, they need to know that their government is behind them and creating an environment for businesses to succeed. Speaker, my question for the minister is, can you please share what work you're doing to reduce red tape and support small businesses in Ontario? The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. And I'd really like to thank the, my colleague and the member for Whitby for his question and the great work that he's doing in his community. Speaker, when this government came into office, we inherited a regulatory system that was stifling business growth. We made a promise to reduce regulatory burden on businesses to grow our economy and create jobs, and we have followed through. We've reduced Ontario's total number of regulatory compliance requirements by 6.5% since June of 2018 and achieved $373 million in net annual savings to businesses not-for-profits, municipalities, universities and colleges, school boards and hospitals in regulatory compliance costs. Last week, I announced Ontario's Fall 2021 Red Tape Reduction Package, and I introduced the Supporting People and Businesses Act to this House. This bundle Once. will build on the work that our government has already done through previous packages support businesses and people right across our province, and I look forward to sharing more details in the supplemental. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. I'm encouraged to see the tremendous progress made so far, and I'm proud that our government has made this a priority. And I also know, Speaker, that like previous bills, the changes made here will have a positive impact on people and businesses across the province. Now, while many changes to regulation and processes have been made to provide immediate support throughout the pandemic, we also need to ensure that we're planning towards the future, Speaker. Would the minister provide more detail on what this bill means for Ontarians now and moving forward? Thank you. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Whitby for another excellent question. Speaker, this bill builds on the progress of previous bills introduced under the leadership of our Premier and my predecessor. It also applies lessons learned from temporary changes introduced during the pandemic that, if passed, will help modernize processes and reduce burdens and unnecessary costs. These items are important. Speaker, cutting costly red tape will help businesses and people rebuild and invest in safety measures, and reducing unnecessary and duplicative requirements for the public and private sector will save time and streamline how government works. Together, alongside digitization initiatives and modernizing regulations, these changes will make interacting with government easier to support individuals Response. and families, and investment and job creation to support our economy now and in the future. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I know a single parent mom in our community. She's the sole caregiver of her 28-year-old son with autism and developmental disabilities. He's been on the wait list for supportive housing since he was 16. During COVID, his routine moved abruptly online, which threw him and his working mom off course. In response, his behavior became violent and last weekend reached the point where mom was forced to call the police. She called this call a nightmare. He's now in hospital. We spoke to DSO last week. They've said upon his discharge, his living situation is likely to remain the same without any other supports available, no housing, not even a caseworker. Speaker, many people with disabilities and their families feel ignored by this Conservative government. Development services agencies are grossly under-resourced. 
My question is to the Premier. Sure. What is the Premier going to do between now, October 18th, and June 2nd, 2022, to ensure families like this are not left behind? To reply for the government, the parliamentary assistant, the member for Ottawa West, Nepea. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite for this important question. Of course, making sure that our individuals in our developmental services sector have received support throughout the COVID-19 pandemic has been a key priority of this government. We recognize that every individual has different needs, which is why each case is reviewed on an individual basis. Those individuals who are assessed to be most in need are prioritized for the available resources. This is not a first come for serve system it is needs based we know that demand is growing in this sector that's why we have invested 13 million dollars over three years through budget 2021 to assist more people with developmental disabilities in accessing community housing and to support their independent living through an expansion of the adult protective service worker program Response. it's also important to note that adults who have requested residential supports are likely to be eligible for funding through both Passport and the ODSP program, and I'll speak more to the reforms that are underway in our development. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, again, my question is to the Premier. Let me be clear. The $13 million over three years is a drop in the bucket. This is not going to address the human rights crisis that many people with disabilities and their families are facing. This government's cuts to social services adds more pressure on people with disabilities and their caregivers who are providing unpaid work, I might add, in some cases 24-7 at the expense of their own income and mental health. This government's $13 million over three years, again, to put that into context, in 2019, the Conservative government handed $12 million over to Loblaws to pay for fridges to one of the wealthiest families in the world, for goodness sakes. Why couldn't their profit pay for their own fridges? Order. Speaker, to the Premier, how does this government order. explain that fridges are a higher priority than this mom Question. and her son with disabilities and developmental disabilities? Will this Premier ensure this mom's son has a safe place to live where he, when he is discharged from the hospital? Because home speaker is no longer an option. Thank you. Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development, come to order. To reply for the government, the parliamentary assistant, member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. And to be clear, over the past year, our government has invested a record $2.9 billion in developmental services, including more than $1.8 billion for residential supports for individuals with developmental disabilities. And further to that, Speaker, our government is taking action to do much needed reforms to this sector, which has been neglected for over the past 10 years years. We are taking action through our Journey to Belonging reform efforts. I'm pleased to share that our long-term vision for developmental uh, services in Ontario uh, is underway as we speak. We are consulting with members of the community, with agencies, with individuals accessing this serv these services, and we are moving quickly to improve current supports and streamline processes for Response. those accessing services by simplifying the assessment process, improving passport to better address people's needs, reducing the administrative burden on service providers, building skilled staff capacity and introduce Thank you very much. The very next question. The member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians are hearing a lot about how the Premier is a yes man, and it's true. He said yes to appointing his friends and their families to plumb positions. He said yes to killing the green economy. The Premier said yes to cutting uh, public health funding, and he said yes to returning kids to unsafe classrooms. Monsieur le Président, le Premier ministre a dit oui à une un, un attaque contre les francophones. Yes the, the Premier said no yes to everything that Speaker, affect our economy. Say yes to billion-dollar businesses opening to full capacity and overpriced beer, while local restaurants and small businesses receive virtually no support from this government. When will the Premier start saying yes to small businesses and stop saying yes to his friends on Bay Street. Thank you. To reply, 
Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. But let's be very clear. Had the Liberals said yes at any point in the 15 years that they were in power, we wouldn't be in the situation that we are in today, Mr. Speaker. They said no to increasing ICU capacity. What was the result of that lack of investment in ICU capacity, Mr. Speaker? The province of Ontario, one of the largest and most important economic zones in North America, was brought to its knees because the Liberals failed to make those investments in ICU capacity. We have said that 800 people in an ICU will never bring down the province of Ontario again. Shame on the Liberals for not doing Doing that, Mr. Speaker. We also Order. knew we also knew that investments had to be made in long-term care, Mr. Speaker. They didn't do it, Mr. Speaker, when in coalition with the NDP. 600 beds, I think, is, is the, the sum total. I have Position more than that being Order. built in my own riding, Mr. Speaker, on way to 30,000, Mr. Speaker. What? Had the Liberals just said no to high energy prices, our small, medium, and large job creators wouldn't have fled this province the way they did in the years that the Liberals were in office, Mr. Speaker. What we have done is said yes to small job creators, yes to an economy, and yes to a. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplementals for the Premier. And of course, the government does like to say yes. They say yes to closing playgrounds, but say no to safer schools. They say yes to capacity stadiums while saying no to family restaurants. For they said, they said yes to an iron ring and long term. Stop the clock. Member for Kitchener Conestoga, come to order. Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. For the second time, come to order. Restart the clock. Remember, they said yes to an iron ring around long-term care, but said no to the funding and the inspections to get it done. They said yes to celebrating frontline workers, but have said no to paying them a fair wage and guaranteeing their sick leave. On the issues that matter most to Ontarians, the Premier is saying yes on television while telling them no around the Cabinet table. Mr. Speaker, which is it? Is the Premier the yes man he's selling us on TV, or is he the doctor no he's acting out behind closed doors? Again, to reply, the Government House Leader. Yet, Mr. Speaker, when the new Liberal leader had an opportunity to set down his platform for the next election, what did he say yes to? Well, maybe doing some reform of how we elect people. That's all that mattered to the Liberal leader, Mr. Speaker. What we have done is this. We took power in 2018. We saw an economy that was driving away jobs because of red tape, Mr. Speaker. We set immediately to change that. We looked at other areas of the economy, reducing taxes for our small, medium, and large job creators. We looked at the overwhelmingly high cost of energy in the province of Ontario, and we tackled that immediately, Mr. Speaker, getting rid of high costs of contracts that the, the Liberals brought in for their friends, Speaker, we made those changes. We made investments in health care. We made investments in long-term care. We're making investments in transit and transportation, Mr. Speaker. Unlike the Liberals who talk about the North and talk about the Ring of Fire, we're Fox? actually making progress by working with our First Nations partners to make sure that the resources of the Ring of Fire can benefit the economy of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. We are making great progress. The people of Ontario are making great progress, and this economy is well on its way. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for kitchener conestoga Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Attorney General. Speaker, organizations like Canada's Assaulted Women's Helpline have reported increased call volumes during the COVID-19 pandemic. The people of my riding need to know that their government is working to help victims of intimate partner violence. Last week, the Attorney General announced a $67,000 grant for the Brain Injury Association of Waterloo Wellington's Intimate Partner Violence Response Program. Speaker, this is an important program in my region that provides critical supports to those who have suffered a brain injury due to intimate partner violence. This investment, made through the Civil Remedies Grant Program, will make a big difference in the lives of victims of interpart um, intimate partner violence in my riding. Could the Attorney General please tell us how our government is working with local partners like the Brain Injury Association of Waterloo Wellington, police and prosecutors to support victims and fight back against crime? And to reply, the Attorney General. Thank you, and I want to thank the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for the question and for his insights and his support in the region of, of Kitchener-Conestoga and Kitchener-Waterloo in general. As the member knows and as we've talked about, the tremendous work the Brain Injury Association of Waterloo-Wellington is doing, it is vital to one of the fastest growing regions in our province. The supports that are provided there locally are tremendously important for victims as they are in the process of seeking justice and taking steps toward overcoming the terrible violence they've experienced. This important project was one of 18 
that our government supported this year through the Civil Remedies Grant Program. It's funded through cash and proceeds seized from criminals. After funding 33 projects that targeted human trafficking last year, this year's Civil Remedies Grant Program investments have been directed to help victims of crime and strengthen local capacity to prevent intimate partner, family, and gun and gang violence. Mr. Speaker, we agree with Ontarians who say, who say crime should not pay, and the Civil Response? Remedies Grant Program, is, Grant Program is one more concrete action we're taking to make a lasting difference in Kitchener-Waterloo. Once again, supplementary question. Well, thank you very much, Minister. This funding is welcome news in my riding, and I'm relieved to hear that after years of neglect and disinterest under NDP-supported Liberal governments, our government is focused on supporting victims of crime and dismantling the criminal networks that prey on our communities. My constituents need to know that our government is committed to supporting law enforcement, prosecutors and community organizations to help break the cycle of offending. Could the Attorney General please tell us? how this government is stepping up to support Ontario communities' fight against crime and confront victimization. Thank you, Speaker. To reply the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government is committed to strengthening every available tool, including civil forfeiture, to help police, prosecutors, and local partners fight back against criminal networks. It's why we made changes to Ontario's civil forfeiture laws to help them catch up with the rest of the country in, in the 2020 Smarter and Stronger Justice Act. Crime should never pay and the $1.5 million investment of seized funds that we've been discussing through that program, it tangibly strengthens local capacity to prevent intimate partner, family, and gun and gang violence. In addition to building the capacity and improving access to supports for victims of crime, this year's grants will also help community organizations do the vital work needed to help keep our youth safe and safe on the streets and at home. And that's only the beginning. The reinvestment of cash seized from criminals is also helping support people experiencing victimization due to the crime through mental health crisis services. Response. Specialized care and support and education and training opportunities. We're enhancing all of those, Mr. Speaker. And we've also provided funds for the North to help with the drug crisis in rural and remote Northern First Nation communities. Our government has been clear. We will not allow criminal networks to prey on our communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. Uh, the Windsor community is reeling from the shock of losing a shift at the Stellantis plant. 1,800 jobs lost by next April. The repercussions are widespread. The Premier to date hasn't said anything. When GM lost jobs, the Premier said, and I quote, the ship has left the dock, unquote. What is this government going to do to save these jobs in Windsor? They deserve answers. The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and <clears throat> thank you for the question. We uh, are disappointed to learn of the Stellantis decision to reduce the Windsor Assembly Plant to one shift uh, operation in 2022. We want the employees at Stellantis uh, Plant to know that our government stands with them and their families. We need to continue. Uh, with the right supports to ensure long-term growth to create stable and good-paying jobs in the sector. We're committed to the success of Ontario's auto manufacturing sector and the 100,000 people who are directly employed before COVID-19. That's why we developed Driving Prosperity, so the auto sector can remain resilient and adaptable now and in the future. We encourage Stellantis Response. to continue to work with their union to ensure that everything is being done to protect good jobs in Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the people of Windsor, these workers in Windsor, they don't need your thoughts and prayers. They don't need your disappointment. They need leadership, and Ontario deserves an auto strategy, and we've needed it for years. And you know this because you were on this side of the House asking for that same auto strategy. Instead of doing that, the Premier stands at the border and waves goodbye to these jobs. Windsor needs a Premier that is going to fight for these jobs, not wave the white flag. What is this government going to do, tangible actions, what are you going to do to save these 1,800 jobs in the city of Windsor? Mr. Economic Development. Thank you, Speaker. The member asked about an auto strategy, and thankfully, when we put driving prosperity in place two years ago, after years of neglect, we saw an unprecedented $5 
billion dollars announcement in auto investments in 30 days alone, followed two months later by a further billion dollar investment. Six billion dollars investment in the last year. This is unprecedented, Speaker. And today we continue to commit to look not only at those uh, six billion dollars in auto investments, but we are looking at the electric vehicle battery plants that go with them. We've launched a critical minerals program to bring those minerals to Ontario. We're looking at everything we can be doing to enhance the future of auto in the province of Ontario, whether it's in the ma making of the automobiles, the making of the batteries, and the mining of the minerals that go into those batteries. That is driving prosperity. The next question, the member for Guelph. Here, my question is for the Premier. Two weeks ago, Ontarians celebrated Ontario Agriculture Week. A week ago today, Ontarians celebrated local food with their families. The food and farming sector employs over 800,000 people, contributing $50 billion to Ontario's GDP. But we learned over the weekend that the Premier is going to double down on his scheme to build a $10 billion highway that will pave over 2,000 acres of farmland, parts of the green belt, and unleash sprawl on thousands of acres of farmland. It makes no economic or financial sense. So, Speaker, will the Premier say yes to local food? Will the Premier say to local food yes to local food and farming jobs and say no to Highway 413, which will destroy farmland and food and farming jobs? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I'm proud to be part of a government that is expanding the Green Belt and investing in the future. Speaker. Let's put this in perspective. This is a growing population, and I don't blame them. Secret South, this is the best place to live in the world. The GTA is expanding by 3 million people in 25 years. In fact, the Greater Golden Horseshoe Speaker, by 2046, is going to hit almost 15 million people. That is incredible growth. And unlike the last government, this government is going to say yes to focusing on that growth, focusing on the future, so we can enjoy what this province has to offer, not just today, but for many generations to come, Speaker. Major highways are a crucial artery for the people of this province, not just to get to and from work and back to their loved ones, but to make sure that those food products from our local farmers reach the markets they need to reach, and we continue to be that economic engine that runs North America. Speaker, this government will continue to invest in transit today and tomorrow. A supplementary question. Speaker, we need a history lesson here. The 401 was built to address congestion in the GTA. Then the 407 was built to do it. Unfortunately, it got sold off. And now they're saying the 413. When will this government learn? Building more highways leads to more congestion and more sprawl and directly threatens Ontario's food and farming economy. It's a financial disaster to waste $10 billion on a highway that will save people 30 seconds. It's an economic disaster to pave over the farmland that feeds us and creates jobs in the local food economy. And it's a climate disaster to be building more highways like this when we have to drastically and urgently reduce climate pollution. So will the Premier say no to the land speculators who will benefit from this highway? and say yes to the people and farmers who know we need this land to feed us and to protect us from flooding. Again, the Associate Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for the member opposite, and I'm sure he can agree that the last government did very little to protect our green space. In fact, under the Ontario Liberals, we lost 100 hectares of forest and 30 hectares of wetland that was removed from highway uh, construction. Approximately 330 hectares of the Greenbelt was impacted. The Greenbelt was changed. 17 times under the last government, Speaker. Well, this government's doing things differently. We are working with our partners in Ottawa to make sure there is an EA conducted to make sure that we are minimizing the impacts on our green space and our farmland. This is something Stephen Del Duca never did or never supported, Speaker. But we understand there's a balance here to look forward to the growing needs of our province, a growing population, and to keep commerce moving in this great province. Speaker, I will reiterate, those studies are continuing. We're going to make sure what's, due, what's right for the people of this province. And as I said before, it's it's not just about today, it is for those generations to come. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Hey. My 
questions to the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. My question is, uh, as, as Ontario has taken significant action to keep our neighbourhoods, parks, lakes, rivers and streams clean and free of litter and waste, reducing the impacts of waste in our environment and communities has been a major focus of this government over the past three years. Could the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks please share with this House some of the initiatives that they will be undertaking to educate Ontarians as part of this year's Waste Reduction Week? The Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, the member for Barry Innisfil. Well, thank you to the member for Sarnia Lambton for that excellent question and all his advocacy in his community and uh, everything he does stand up for. This week marks Waste Reduction Week that kicks off today and goes all the way until October 24th. It's a national run campaign and it's an opportunity to remind Ontarians what they can do uh, to help their environment. We saw this summer tremendous uptake that Ontarians really care about litter and waste reduction. 3.1 million Ontarians reacted to our Day of Action on Litter and Waste Free Wednesday campaign. They know that uh, we need to reduce plastic pollution in our waterways, and right now 22 pounds of plastic end up in our Great Lakes. But, Speaker, thanks to the improvements that we're making in innovative plastic capture technology, less plastic waste is now ending up in our lakes, and this is great news. But, Speaker, there is more. We're also improving our recyclable our recycle program Fine. to increase the amount of things that are recyclable and much more, just so Ontarians can do a little bit more for their environment. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Parliamentary Assistant for answering that question. Waste Reduction Week sounds like a very important initiative to keep our communities safe and clean. I know that in my riding of Sarnia Lambton, my constituents are always wondering what our government has done to reduce waste and ways to contribute to reducing litter in their communities. Could the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks please share with this House on what the government is further doing to keep litter out of our communities, lakes and rivers? Thank you. And to reply, Member for Barry Innistrad. And thank you to the member from Sarnia Lambton. He knows that if you spend one hour each weekend cleaning up litter, you can collect up to four full bags of garbage, and that is something that is tangible and something that each Ontarian can do. And I want to thank those Ontarians and my colleagues who participated in Waste Free Wednesdays this summer, where we collected over 150 bags of litter, which was 3,300 pounds if you equate it to weight, which is also the equivalent of a female hippo. Speaker, the answer is clear. Ontarians want to do something about their environment. They want to join our government in the supports that we're offering when it comes to protecting our parks, our lakes, our rivers, and our Neighborhoods. Things like improving our recyclable program, which will now see more things being able uh, to be recycled and reused. For example, now more than 50% of our battery waste is now reused into other materials, something that was uh, difficult for other governments Boss. to accomplish. And of course, we're reducing um, the amount of organic waste in our landfills as well. Speaker, we are on it. Ontarians want to do something about it, and we are doing something about it. I hope the opposition actually joins us to do something about it for a change. Thank you. Next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the loss of OHIP insured eye exams is a huge blow to families in London and across the province. Despite months of notice, the government stopped negotiating with optometrists, and kids, seniors, and persons with disabilities are starting to miss their eye exams. They are not receiving their health care. A London mom, Jessica, told me how increased screen time during the pandemic has hurt her children's eyes. She told me that her oldest daughter has been complaining about her eyes since the amount of screen time drastically increased last year with online schooling. She is now struggling on a daily basis. It's affecting her ability to learn. Karen is another London mom who reached out to me to let me know her daughter was experiencing difficulty seeing the board. She wrote to me saying, imagine my surprise when I called her optometrist and was told that I was unable to book an eye exam. Kids have had their learning disrupted for the past Response? two school years, and now the lack question. of eye care is making this new school year even harder for them. Why isn't the minister putting the proper funding in place to make sure kids get the eye care they need and deserve? The parliamentary assistant, member for Edmonton Lawrence. Thank you. Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for this important question. We're extremely disappointed that at the urging of the Ontario Optometrists Association, some optometrists have chosen to withhold publicly funded services for our youth and seniors. And it's really due to the fact that the OAO continues to decline an independent third-party uh, mediate, third mediator's invitation to come back to the table and the conditions that have to be met for negotiations to resume. 
It's really concerning because they continue to tell the public, and the member opposite seems to have uh, adopted this, that they are at the table when, in fact, they are not. And the current impasse lies squarely at the feet of the OAO, which, instead of participating in these good faith negotiations, is choosing to demand an outcome before allowing negotiations to start. The government has made a reasonable and fair offer, and it's the beginning of a future negotiations. And we would just like the OAO to come back to the table but so that people, such as the ones that you have mentioned in your question, can get the eye care services that they should get. Thank you. Supplementary question. Back to the premier. You know, the members' disappointment and concerns should be about the underfunding on your watch. Speaker, optometrists and London families are ready for OHIP-funded eye care services, but this government keeps telling them no. That's concerning for Londoners like Dennis, who rely on annual eye appointments to do his job. Dennis is a senior in my riding who works as a crossing guard near his local school. Eye exams are a regular part of his job to ensure kids can get to school safely. But his appointment this year was postponed because this government refuses to negotiate with optometrists. Unless this issue is resolved by November, Dennis risks not being able to do his job. I also think of persons with disabilities, such as diabetes, like my constituent Mandy, who wrote to me, I am unable to book or receive care from my optician due to the current government's unrealistic determination of fair pay to opticians. I will go blind and become a drain on the government if this does not get rectified as soon as possible. Question. Speaker, when is this government going to stop saying no and make sure seniors like Dennis and people like Mandy can access the care they need to go about their daily lives? Again, the Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Health, to respond. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite. Obviously, this is a very important issue, and anyone who has been denied an appointment, who needs to have an appointment, and ha has any harm or suffering as a result of any delay, should reach out to the College of Optometrists. Optometrists have professional obligations to fulfil, and if they don't do so, the College of Optometrists will help direct people to a another provider. I'll just say our government has made a fair and reasonable offer, an immediate compensation increase of 8.48% retroactive to April 1st, which is a catch-up fee of increases physicians got, a one-time payment of $39 million to catch up for uh, increases that they didn't have for the last decade under a former government, future fee increases aligned with physician fee increases, as well as a commitment to immediately establish a working group to look at the overhead costs they, they seem to want us to look at, and we're happy to do that. Finally, a commitment for ongoing monthly Response. discussions through an optometry services review committee. We are at the table, ready, willing, and able. They need to come to the table so that we can negotiate a fair and reasonable agreement, which all Ontarians want. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Um, Speaker, we've entered the hyper-partisan election season in Ontario. The people around the Premier want the people of Ontario to believe that this man is someone who indiscriminately and cheerfully says yes to every request of him. But when it comes to support for people, Mr. Speaker, immediately upon the, his election, this Premier said no to an increased minimum wage, no to Indigenous curriculum writing teams. He went on to say no to funding for smaller class sizes during COVID, Order. no to a, max, a vaccine mandate for health and education workers, no to a logical reopening for small businesses, and for months and months, no to paid sick days. Mr. Speaker, when there has been a prolonged outcry and the Premier caves on an issue such as sick days, the answer has been less like yes and more like, all right, all right, we'll do something. The government's response on sick days is a half measure because it is temporary. Having come this far through the pandemic, will the Premier now actually say yes to 10 permanent paid sick days? To reply, the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I can tell uh, the former Premier that we will always say yes to workers uh, in this province. We're going to continue uh, every single day uh, have their Order. Lives, Mr. Speaker, to support uh, families and all of our communities. That's why, uh, Mr. Speaker, I was proud uh, today to announce that Ontario is going to be launching the most comprehensive uh, system uh, in the country when it comes to protecting workers that work through uh, temp help agencies uh, and recruiters. Uh, Mr. Speaker, no worker in Ontario should fear going to work. No worker in this province should sleep on straw mattresses. Mr. Speaker, no worker in Ontario should have their passport with or, or held by their employer. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, I was proud to uh, join today with my parliamentary assistant to uh, ensure that we're bringing forward, Spons? again, uh, a comprehensive licensing system to ensure that workers in Ontario are protected, something the former government did not do. This supplementary question. 
Speaker, I'm, you know, I, I'm pleased that the government is picking up on the work on temp agencies, which was started under our government. But, Mr. Speaker, this government has said no to workers over and over and over. They cancelled sick days. They didn't raise the minimum wage. They changed the regulations around PSWs and the supports in long-term care and being able to work in one place. Mr. Speaker, as soon as this government was elected, it repealed legislation that actually protected workers. Mr. Speaker, I suppose it is part of the political game to praise reckless support of development of environmentally sensitive land, to behave as though slogans and backslapping are actual responses to real-world problems but it is a dangerous part of the political landscape, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that real people need the support of their government in this very trying time. Rather than sitting on billions of dollars, this government had the opportunity to invest in businesses, in communities, Question. in schools and in people's lives. Post-pandemic, people will still get sick, and without paid sick days, they will still be at risk. Will the Premier commit to making 10 paid sick days permanent? And if not, why not, Mr. Speaker? The other Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, uh, the former Premier brought forward two paid sick days. We are at three paid sick days today in the province of Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the former uh, Liberal Premier of this province that she and her government said no to more than 300,000 workers in this province that lost their job under you. Mr. Speaker, Order. we're continuing uh, to build back uh, a better province here as we come out of this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, we will always be with working people uh, in this province. We're going to continue uh, to support them. That's one of the reasons, for example, Mr. Speaker, that we're uh, so passionate about getting more young people into the skilled trades. These are jobs that pay six figures, that have defined pensions and benefits. And I have to remind uh, the member opposite that when she was a premier of this province, there is a 40 per cent reduction in apprenticeship registrations. We are going to build back a better province and not take advice from the Liberal Party. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Health. Ontarians have expected and received the best cancer care in all of Canada and beyond. While the minister claims that cancer surgeries and services continue during the pandemic, a study from the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network shows us that it is not so. Ontario cancer patients have the longest wait time in Canada. Specifically, cancer patients now wait 46 long days for their cancer surgery and 34 long days for their cancer care appointment. These delays has a profound impact on the health of cancer patients, including their mental health for themselves and their caregiver. When will cancer patients in Ontario gain access to timely Question. cancer surgery? And where is the minister's plan to bring down the long wait time for cancer care? Member for Eglinton Lawrence, the Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, and thank you to the member opposite for this important question. I also met with the Canadian Cancer Survivors Network and discussed some of those statistics, and I don't remember them quite the way you have cited them. There were some statistics that we're doing well on, uh, and some, some we need to improve, obviously. But we have um, an $1.8 billion investment into our hospital sector that we've made. We're dedicating $300 million to reducing surgical backlogs for delayed or cancelled surgeries and procedures due to the pandemic. And I want to be clear that this investment is in addition to over $200 million that we announced last fall, and uh, that means a half a billion dollars invested to reduce the backlog of surgeries and procedures. And the funding will ensure that hospitals can expand their hours and keep operating rooms open over the weekend. We don't want to have anyone waiting unnecessarily for their surgeries. I should also point out that we did uh, complete an average of 88 per cent of targeted surgical allocation at all hospitals Response. across the province. Over 430,000 scheduled surgeries have taken place since the start of the pandemic. So we're working very hard to clear the backlog and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. The supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario used to have the best cancer care system. Now, 42 per cent of cancer patients are not satisfied with the quality of their care. This is unheard of in Ontario. For people trying to get their cancer diagnosis, it is even worse, with 66% of them 
not satisfied with the care or lack thereof they are receiving. Minister, Ontarians trust in our health care system, our cancer system is being eroded. What is the Minister of Health going to do to address this unacceptable drop in the quality of our cancer care system and services? When is she going to acknowledge that these long delays are problematic and put forward an action Question. plan to bring the quality of cancer care back to meet the good people of Ontario's expectations? Parliamentary Assistant, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I, I thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, we are seeing improving uh, trends, obviously, with COVID-19 indicators and vaccination rates, and Ontario Health has issued a memo to hospitals to safely resume non-urgent and non-emergent surgeries and procedures, including those requiring inpatient and critical care resources. And that means that the hospitals that meet the criteria that Ontario Health has specified will be working closely to try to clear those backlogs. So we do have a plan going forward to try to clear these backlogs. And since the start of this out uh, outbreak or pandemic, our government has really been transparent that we are sparing no expense when it comes to providing Ontarians with access to the high quality care they know and expect, and that applies to our cancer system as well, which is obviously very important, and we plan to catch up and, uh, and make sure that those cases are dealt with as quickly as, as compassionately as possible. Thank you. Member for York Centre. Morning, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. On Friday, I was visited by a constituent, Initial L an educator with the Toronto District School Board for 30 years. She teaches grade five and raised generations of North Yorkers. Five years ago, Elle was diagnosed with serious cardiovascular disease. She has been steady since, but she fears inflammation of the heart. Like many Ontarians who are not members of the Ontario PC Caucus, she is unable to get an exemption. The school board is threatening that unless she vaccinates by the end of the month, she may be terminated. Whether she is right or wrong on the science or cardiology, she fears. She fears inflammation of her precious heart. Speaker, the minister's office is denying that the government blocked my jobs and jabs bill, which means they understand the merit of it, and because if passed, L will keep her job. I know this minister purports to be a kind and faithful man. I know him. Will he do something to protect my constituent, or will he sentence L to unemployment? Mr. We're training. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, we continue to encourage um, everyone out there uh, who's able uh, to get vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that uh, more than 87% of the people of Ontario who are eligible are now vaccinated with one dose, uh, more than 83% a double dose. Um, of course, we always uh, encourage everyone, uh, if they need to, to consult uh, with their, uh, their doctors uh, if needed. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue uh, to protect uh, the health and safety uh, of everyone, the well-being of everyone uh, in this province. We've really, uh, together, have come so far from uh, when this pandemic hit uh, back in, in March of 2020, and we encourage everyone, let's just keep working together. Let's get through this. We're doing much better than uh, many jurisdictions around the world. Let's keep that momentum going. Supplementary question. Speaker, my follow-up is to the Solicitor General. The government is silent, as thousands of Ontarians are losing their jobs daily because of their lawful medical choice. According to the Premier, approximately 15 per cent of Ontario's health care workers remain unvaccinated. After months of willful blindness, the government realized on Friday that suspension or termination of 15 per cent of health care workers may lead to the collapse of the health care system. They're now looking for ways to backpedal on their negligence. But how about police, fire and EMS, who are also stretched thin? Are their jobs not worth preserving? Because unless there's a serious crime, it's difficult to get a police officer in North York, while a record number of fire and paramedics are on stress leave. Can we afford to terminate first responders and risk that no one shows up when we call 911? Will the Solicitor General protect our police, fire and EMS from suspension or termination, or will the government dither Question. and flip-flop later, as it is about to finally do on Ontario's health care workers? Again, the Minister of Labour. Again, my message to uh, everyone uh, in the, this province is to, to keep working together. Uh, I've had an opportunity to speak uh, with uh, health care workers, uh, with police, with firefighters. Uh, the overwhelming majority uh, of people in this province are uh, getting vaccinated. That's important. We've come so far uh, as a province from 
uh, back in those dark days when the pandemic hit uh, Ontario. I'm proud of what we've been able uh, to accomplish together, employers, employees, all of the people in this province working together. And uh, I know the Ontario spirit, the Premier does in all of our government, and all MPPs, or at least most MPPs. And we're going to continue getting this together, getting uh, uh, through this together, Mr. Speaker. Next question, member for York Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. St. Bernard School in York Southwest tries to provide excellent education, but recently had classrooms closed and teachers dis displaced. Their classes are at maximum capacity and can't accept any new students. This means the newly built townhouses down this street with parents of young children would have to transport their youngsters elsewhere. How is this acceptable, uh, Mr. Speaker? When will the government admit that classes need to be smaller and teachers should not be cut? Education. Uh, well, we certainly would agree with the member opposite that uh, that's why we provided $300 million for the second year in a row to hire more educators, to hire more staff, custodians, ECs, and principals, because we recognize part of the layered approach advised by the Ontario Science Table was to take a multitude of actions, one of which includes distancing within our schools, which we are achieving uh, through the investments the province has made, in addition to the enhancement of masking, the indoor masking requirement, the screening before children enter a school, and the massive improvement in ventilation at that school and at every one of the publicly funded schools in this province. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of the fact that Ontario has one of the highest vaccination rates for youth in the country. We have one of the lowest case rates for youth in the country because we have followed the best expert advice of the Ontario Science Table of Sick Kids and the Chief Medical Officer of Health. We will continue to do so to ensure that our schools are safe, they remain open, and kids continue to learn in this province. Question period for this morning. Yeah, this house stands in recess until 1 p.m.